My name is Roger Buck, here in the north of Ireland, and today I'm going to tell you a fictional story about something that happened to me last week, or maybe it didn't happen, with a new age guy called Mac. Mac happens to be short for McEnroe, as in John McEnroe. And therein hangs a tale, because there's a definite link between the New Age movement and something that John McEnroe became rather famous for. By now, you may be rightly wondering, what is Roger harping on about now? What with weird links between Wimbledon and the Age of Aquarius? Or things that happened or didn't happen? I mean, come on, tell us, did they or didn't they? Uh, well, friends, things will be revealed. But right now, I beg your patience, because there are reasons. Um, I'm speaking in riddles, and really, they're rather tender, poignant, and delicate reasons. I will say that uh, I did have a blast from my New Age past this last weekend. Uh, my New Age past, I say, because as most of you know, um, I was heavily involved in the New Age movement for many years. I was at Findhorn. I was something of a New Age activist for a very long time before I finally discovered the Catholic mystery. And yeah, uh, an old friend, a friend I'll call Mac, came over from Britain. Um, to visit me here in Ireland. Um, and Mac's visit has brought up a lot of tender things, because really, I love Mac. I find Mac to be a kind, sensitive, very idealistic soul. And yet, there's a certain chasm between us, because for the life of him, Mac cannot, cannot understand how, how, how could I have ever converted to Catholicism? And there are other painful things that came up that make me reticent to speak publicly, but I'm taking certain measures here. First, I'm obviously using anonymity. Uh, obviously, this is something writers and commentators do, change the names to protect the innocent, so to speak. Um, but I'm actually doing more to blur, blur, Max identity. I'm adding some fictional elements into the mix. In other words, the New Age Mac that I'm going to talk about now in this video is not exactly the Mac who came to see me this weekend. Rather, it's a composite of many different New Age Macs who share some similar f features, including the fact that they are baffled. Baffled. Baffled by how I could ever become Catholic. And, yes, as you'll see, this bafflement is one of the reasons I am mysteriously evoking this man here. So, again, this video is something of a fable. Anyway, sit back. Let me tell you a story. The story takes place in a cold and wet winter in my little Irish hamlet. You can see our village church here through the window. But over in America, there are democratic primary elections starting up. And for the first time ever, there's been a new age candidate for president, Marianne Williamson. We will be coming to Williamson shortly. Anyway, back to Mac and me in Ireland. And something about Mac and me is that we're not unlike old comrades in arms. And that's because back in the day, back in my new age past, uh, when I was a full-time new age activist, initiating numerous new age projects, Mac really helped me out on a lot of those pro projects. Mac really believed in me, helped me. Um, we've both been at Findhorn together. Indeed, we've both lived at Findhorn at different times in our lives. Um, and yet today, there is this poignant chasm between us. But here's the rub. I can feel this chasm, but Mac can't. Not really. Not, doesn't feel it like I feel it. 
And there are obviously reasons for that. Uh, most obviously is that Mac isn't a Catholic. Uh, Mac doesn't have the experience really of practicing any religion, um, just like most New Agers. Um, and so Mac really just has this one experience of participating in New Age spirituality, whereas I have two experiences. I know what it's like to be a New Ager, and I know what it's like to be a Catholic. And friends, they're like night and day. That's my inner experience. Obviously, Mac doesn't have that. But there's something else. Mac can't even believe that a chasm exists or a chasm is possible. Why can't Mac believe that a chasm is possible? Well, it's because there's a very key point of New Age ideology. And according to that key point of New Age ideology, there can't be two different spiritualities because there's only one timeless spirituality in the world. Only one. And that's really a key point, friends, that I really, uh, forgive me, I'm going to really uh, restress this. There is only one timeless, essential spirituality which simply manifests in different ways, in different times and cultures. So it follows that in the New Age, uh, religious differences are not taken seriously. Um, indeed, uh, religious differences are often seen as illusion, or at least the result of illusion. Um, indeed, many things in the New Age are seen as illusion. Um, you may be hearing, friends, there's this howling Irish wind and rain um, while I'm recording. Hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, but many New Agers would see, well, that's an illusion. Um, I don't want to laugh, but yeah, the New Age has a very, very Eastern basis. And Eastern religions, you know, have the idea of Maya, the world is an illusion. So yes, illusion is a key theme for a lot of New Agers. So religious differences are illusory. Um, there's just this oneness. And actually, um, here's another thing that New Age Mac once said to me. Uh, something like this. He said, Roger, well, you know, uh, for me, religions are like window dressing. Window dressing in a shop. And I'm not interested in window dressing. I want to go into the shop and get to what it's really all about. And what's in the shop for New Age Mac, of course, is this timeless, eternal, groovy, essential spirituality represented by the New Age. And if I try to say to New Age Mac, well, Catholicism isn't just window dressing for New Age spirituality, um, it doesn't make sense to him. It goes so against the grain of everything he's believed for many years, everything he's actually deeply, deeply attached to. Um, so this is, this is why, um, you know, with all kinds of New Age Max, they cannot take seriously that I've changed. You know, another way of putting it is that Catholicism is just like icing on the cake to them. And underneath, Roger is just the same old cake, the same old fruit cake, maybe. No, the same old cake um, I've always been. I've just added a little bit of, you know, um, Catholic icing on the top. Nothing's really changed. Nothing's different. Uh, because it can't be. And also part of this is because, you know, New Age Mac, um, as I say, loves me. And actually, I think, respects me. New Age Mac thinks that, you know, I'm probably thinks I'm fairly intelligent. Um, and this is another problem, because it's so ingrained in New Age ideology that Catholicism is backwards. It's retrograde. It belongs to, you know, the old age, not the new age. You know, indeed, if you know, New Age Mac, as I say, is a very kind person, so he wouldn't say this. But, you know, the idea is basically there that Catholicism is stupid backwards. I used to think the same thing myself. 
you know, I'm not, you know, so, so it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to New Age Matt, but here's this intelligent guy, Roger, and he's taken on something really stupid. Um, he can't believe it. He can't believe that I've really, really changed. And, um, as I say, there are reasons he can't believe it. Um, I don't want to judge him. Um, but anyway, all of this came up rather poignantly. Um, this this weekend, when the subject of Marion Williamson came up and her candidacy for president, because when Mac was here, she was still running for president. Now, she's just dropped out of the race, um, but she was still running at the time, and Mac was excited. Mac was excited by this presidency. And friends, believe it or not, Mac assumed that I would be excited too. Or at least that I would be approving, you know, of such a highly conscious individual as Marion Williamson running for president. And before we go further, I think I'd better just say a little bit more about who Marion Williamson is. And maybe the best place to start is her own website, Marianne.com, where we read that spiritual growth involves giving up the stories of your past, so the universe can write a new one. And whatever that means, it certainly includes giving up the story of traditional Christianity, as we shall see. And her biography reads, Marianne Williamson is an internationally acclaimed lecturer, activist, and author of four number one New York Times best-selling books. She has been one of America's most well-known public voices for more than three decades. Goes on to say she's been a popular guest on television programs such as Oprah, Good Morning America, and Bill Maher. Uh, a quote from the mega bestseller, A Return to Love, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Well, there you have it, friends. My greatest fear, apparently, is that I am powerful beyond measure. And it seems like that's your greatest fear as well, that you are powerful beyond measure. What can I say? So much New Age spirituality is about power like this. Personal power. Power to get your needs met. Um, and you can just do everything by yourself. I sometimes call New Age spirituality, do-it-yourself spirituality. D-I-Y. All of which stands, obviously, in a certain contrast um, to our Lord Jesus Christ saying, Without me, you can do nothing. At any rate... Uh, Marion Williamson is one of the leading um, New Age gurus on the American popular scene, and her major inspiration has been a book called A Course in Miracles. What is A Course in Miracles? Well, let's hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So, because a lot of your politics does spring from this former life you had, or I guess the life you'll continue if you don't win, uh, is based on, well, this book called A Course in Miracles? Well, my career well, for the last 35 years, I have given talks based on this set of books called A Course in Miracles, which has been referred to as a self-study program of spiritual psychotherapy. <laughs> I read that the author of the book, Helen Sheckman, said she took dictation from Jesus. Well, there's nothing in the book. Maybe she did. Maybe she felt that way. Friends, I don't want to accuse uh, Ms. Williamson of lying, but this simply does not seem accurate to me. While it's true that A Course in Miracles almost never uh, explicitly um, claims that Jesus is the author, although I think in one passage it is actually quite, quite explicit, um, it's nonetheless true that throughout the entire course of the book, this is powerfully implied that the book is channeled from Jesus, that Jesus dictated the text. 
Um, it's implied because much of The Course in Miracles is in first person, with a voice saying, I did this, I did that, I said this, I said that. And that voice says kinds of things like this. I was crucified. I went through the crucifixion, and um, it was misunderstood. Uh, the gospel has it wrong. It does not mean what the Bible says it means. Or, I said this to my apostles, and my apostles misunderstood me, and again, the gospel has it wrong. Um, friends, I studied A Course in Miracles in my New Age youth. I've known dozens and dozens of people um, studying it. Um, there's a powerful community around it, and I can tell you that right up to the highest echelons of that community, it is an article of faith that this text comes from Jesus. It is a dogma of the faith, um, you could say, a New Age dogma, very widespread. Anyway, let's hear a little bit more now from Marion Williamson, this time talking to Oprah Winfrey. What is the soul? For me, it's the truth of who we are, the light, the love, which is within us. It goes by different names, but the truth of us. So that's what we're like. Inside is the being that God has already created. Some call it the Christ, the Buddha mind, the Shekinah, mm -hmm. the light, the soul. And our job is to, to get rid of this excess, useless fear, thought forms of the world that actually hide the light of the soul. Who you authentically are is love. But that person said something or did something that so triggered you based on childhood wounds that you're not able in this moment to answer with love and feel psychically like you're getting your needs met. What do you think happens when we die? I think it's extraordinary. Light show, fabulous. I mean, I don't want to rush there, mm -hmm. but I just, it, it, all the blinders are off. That's what I think too. The Course in Miracles says, one day you will realize death is not the punishment, but the reward. All right, some quick points to note. First, there's the New Age ideology I invoked earlier, where all religious differences tend to be obliterated. So, Miss Williamson speaks about Christ, the Buddha mind, the Shekinah, as though it's all the same thing. The Shekinah, if you don't know, is a reference to the Jewish Kabbalah. Um, but really the key idea here is just everything merging into one. Christ, Buddha mind, could be voodoo mind. All the same thing. Um, religious differences are like window dressing. Not important. That's a very, very key thing here. Um, but moving on, let's... You know, there's so much mixed up here, it's, it's hard to know how to treat it all. I mean, some of it seems true to me. I imagine that when I die, the blinders may well be off. And I imagine that when the blinders are off, I'm going to see my life. I'm going to see its sin. I'm going to see its arrogance, the sheer arrogance of my new age youth, which is not to say that I don't struggle with pride and arrogance every day now. Um, I'm going to see, I imagine, so much. But um, in Miss Williamson's view, light show, fabulous. It's all going to be joy, apparently. Um, what will Hitler see, I wonder? Um, or what did Hitler see when he died? I wouldn't like to say, friends, but I tend to imagine, you know, if you were responsible for the deaths of millions upon millions of people, what you would see when you die seems to me it might be rather hellish. But, according to another mega best-selling New Age author, Hitler went straight to heaven because no hell exists. That author is Neil Donald Walsh, and apparently Walsh was told this by no less than God. It seems Walsh has a direct hotline to God, as recorded in his best-selling book series, Conversations with God. And according to his website here, Walsh's books have touched millions and been translated into 37 languages. Here's Walsh again from one of his YouTube videos proclaiming, All you need is you. Again, the new age is DIY spirituality. Do it yourself. 
no need of Jesus Christ or his church. Anyway, in the Williamson and Walsh view of the world, everything that's real appears to be just joy and love, which will be revealed at death. Everything else is illusion. This is actually what The Course in Miracles, in fact, teaches. Which is why, friends, you know, if I think about my life, I think that I know. I probably don't know enough. I'm sure I don't know enough. But I've caused a great deal of suffering um, to all kinds of people. I imagine I will see that suffering when I die. But um, according to The Course in Miracles, you don't cause suffering because suffering is an illusion. That is really what the Course teaches. Um, we're going to go into that in another video. Um, right now, I want to invoke um, this book here. And this book is by uh, an American um, Protestant. His name is Stephen Mansfield. And um, I've often said that I think a lot of the Protestant books on the New Age, alas, aren't very accurate based on my experience of the New Age. I mean, I'm glad that Protestants are often far more awake to what's going on in the New Age um, than Catholics are, it seems to me. But nonetheless, most of the Protestant books on the New Age seem to me quite inaccurate. This one strikes me as an exception. Uh, Mansfield is really seeing something. Um, according to him, um, Oprah will... Oprah Winfrey has has really affected quite a major transformation of American culture. And um, he also speaks about Marion Williamson. And I'm just going to read you just a short bit. Um, so, yeah, he, I mean, he says that Oprah basically brought Williamson to public prominence. And um, he says that Williamson is influential among Oprah's band of New Age teachers. Um, she was, this is Williamson, um, a spiritual advisor to First Lady Hillary Clinton and was there at the famous Camp David gathering of New Age leaders in 1994. Uh, she conducted a wedding ceremony for Elizabeth Taylor and has become a guru to the stars, respected by figures like Anthony Perkins, Leslie Ann Warren, Tommy Toon, Cher, Roy Scheider, David Geffen, Barbara Streisand, Dawn Steele, Roseanne Arquette, and Raquel Welch. Um, what's clear to me, friends, is we have a phenomenon here. Millions and millions of books are being sold. Um, these television programs are being seen all over the world, or at least all over the Anglosphere. Um, um, and, you know, they're influencing key, key figures in the culture. Um, and now things have shifted so much that something that would have been unimaginable in the America that I grew up in, you know, no one in the America I grew up in could imagine this. You know, it's people like Billy Graham, the Protestant evangelical, he was considered like, you know, America's leading kind of religious figure in the 60s and 70s. Now, you know, he was Christian. Now it's non-Christians. Um, and, and this huge change has happened overnight. In the America I grew up in, no one in a million years could imagine um, a democratic uh, primary uh, candidate like Marion Williamson. Um, but now they've been able to see her in the democratic um, debates. Um, now, I, I, I'm not losing any sleep that we're ever going to have a kind of new age president. Um, but this testifies to a massive, and I would say tragic, shift in popular American culture. And yeah, I'm just going to let you see a little bit of Marion Williamson in the nationally televised NBC um, Democratic primary debate. Here we go. Sorry we haven't talked more tonight about how we're going to beat Donald Trump. I have an idea about Donald Trump. So, Mr. President, if you're listening, I want you to hear me, please. You have harnessed fear for political purposes, and only love can cast that out. So I, sir, I have a feeling you know what you're doing. I'm going to harness love for political purposes. I will meet you on that field, and, sir, love will win. All right, what can we say about that? There does appear to be 
such tremendous surety, certainty, Miss Williamson does appear so very, very sure of herself that she is on the side of the power of love. Ah, uh, so much surety here. You know, the New Age claims not to have dogmas, but you scratch the surface and you find all kinds of powerful dogmas, articles of faith. But let me come back to my friend Mac and me in Ireland. Um, so Mac actually seems surprised that I'm not really, you know, very wild about uh, Marion Williamson running for president. Um, and to be fair to Mac, Mac wouldn't be alone. I think a lot of my old New Age friends would assume that, you know, I'd be into this. Um, because in their world, um, they see Marion Williamson as a highly conscious, evolved person. Um, so, you know, she's obviously more evolved, more conscious than your average politician or certainly your average church leader. Um, um, so even if, you know, I'm not a New Ager, wouldn't I be into someone more evolved and more conscious running for political office? Um, yes, I think a lot of my old New Age friends, you know, they don't see that I'm not really into um, New Age books supposedly channeled by Jesus. Um, in other words, they don't really see that I've changed. You know, I have a, another old dear friend from Findhorn. And last year, I went to visit him there. It was my first time back at the community in 25 years. Here's some pictures of the Findhorn community here. And I can't say for certain, but I think my old friend might have imagined that coming back just might help me to remember the good things about Fintor. Like some people, not necessarily my friend, but they may think my problem is just that I've forgotten all the good things about the New Age. Not that I've truly changed in a deep and profound way. Anyway, I hope to do a video about my return to Fintor another time, but right now, suffice it to say, my trip there only confirmed um, all the things that I've been thinking these last, you know, many, many years. Um, because, friends, I had to put a great deal of soul searching um, in my conversion from um, Fintorn, New Age, to Catholic. Um, it, I did have a dramatic, as I say in another episode, episode 10, conversion experience on one night in September 18th, 1997, but really it took me years to sort of undo all this New Age ideology. I mean, friends, some of you might be listening to my old, about my old New Age friends here, and you might be thinking, well, are these people kind of dim or something? Why can't they see that Roger wouldn't be, you know, enthused about the highly conscious Marion Williamson running for president? Um, my friends are not dim. Uh, they're not stupid. They, as I see them, are subject, even victim, to a very, very powerful New Age ideology. And according to that ideology, everything's just really the same. You know, it's just different shop fronts again. New Age shop front, Voodoo shop front, Catholic shop front, all just the same thing. And because of that, any change that I've been through has to be something cosmetic has to be something superficial. I must simply be the same old Roger I always was. And it's very hard to explain to them that the change to being Catholic is something very, very, very profound for me. Um, at one level, that change was very graceful because I did have this conversion experience in 1997 and I started fairly soon after to receive the Catholic sacraments, and that became a daily experience, and the grace of those sacraments working on me day after day after day has an incredible power. But at another level, I had to do enormous, enormous soul searching. There was a lot of angst, um, even mental agony, um, trying to throw off this New Age ideology because I was convinced 
you know, of the same things they are. I was a victim to this ideology. In fact, as I've said in another episode, it's episode four, um, it really took me ten years um, to throw off New Age ideology. And if you're interested in that, I talk about it again here in episode four, How the Sacred Heart Changed My Life Forever. So, yes, there's a powerful ideology here. And really, I would say an immense tragedy because all over the planet there are more and more people thinking like this thinking like new age mac or the various new age mac and rose i've been mentioning i'll be explaining that in a moment but yes they think that religious differences are not serious and obviously they often mean something they mean to be kind i mean new agers are often very kind they sincerely want harmony peace, understanding, inclusiveness. So, New Agers will often say things to me like, I embrace your Catholicism, Roger, or at least I support your Catholicism. Um, Now, I think they often may think privately, you know, you've just got a bit of Catholic baggage in there. Um, Sometimes it's not private. I recall one New Age woman saying to me something like this. Um, She said, I can understand why, you know, you would go back to the security of religion. Like, maybe you need that security blanket. New Agers are very into getting your needs met. Um, So that was fine with her. It was just my security blanket. I don't know. I don't think she ever realized how condescending that sounded. I mean, I don't know. But um, she meant to support me. Um, But sometimes New Agers really do begin to get it, that I am speaking about something seriously different from what they believe. And then I do start to get another kind of reaction, like, you cannot be serious, Roger. I mean, don't you know that Christianity isn't relevant to the modern world? Or don't you know that Catholicism is this archaic, outmoded relic from the age of Pisces? I mean, come on, it's patriarchal, it's dogmatic, it's hierarchical. You cannot be serious. Um, Frankly, the New Asians are very against dogma, and they often have no idea of their serious New Age dogmas. Um, I had one um, old New Age guy I knew. He's actually fairly prominent in the British New Age scene. He he will remain nameless. But he said something like this to me. Um, He privately explained my conversion to Catholicism by suggesting that when I went to sleep at night, I was suffering alien abduction experiences which I could then no longer recall when I woke up. So, there you have it, friends. You want to know why I became a Catholic? It's because aliens ate my brain. Okay, well, I'm having a bit of fun there, and um, hopefully it's okay to have a bit of fun once in a while. Um, But really, we're talking about something really very serious. And sometimes, um, you know, the reaction, you cannot be serious, gets even more intense. Not unlike this, really. You can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious! So, New Agers are rarely angry like that. But scratch the surface and you'll often find that underneath there's a serious strain of anger going on um, towards Christianity or towards people like me when they convert, they dare to convert to Christianity. Um, That's because New Agers are very serious about beliefs that are different from Christianity. Um, um, Indeed, I would say that New Agers are so serious that they have their own set of New Age dogmas. And I can say this because if I look at my past, I certainly was filled with New Age dogmas. Uh, You may be wondering, friends, what this is. 
This is a leaflet from my New Age past. It's a leaflet that I produced for a New Age charity that um, I ran in Cambridge, England for many, many years. Give you a sense of it here. Um, uh, we actually produced something like, during the 10 years we were in Cambridge, we did something like well over a hundred thousand of these leaflets. Went out across the city of Cambridge, and um, yeah, I'll just show you the front of this leaflet here. Um, if you look closely, you can see um, these words that I once proudly believed in. People must be free to explore their spirituality in a way hitherto rare, free of imposed beliefs, dogma, and sectarianism. This is the heart of the New Age idea. So, you see, friends, I once honestly, genuinely believed that I was promoting a new, non-dogmatic, non-divisive, non sectarian approach to a new spirituality appropriate for a new age, a new age of Aquarius. And, you know, I, I believed in things like A Course in Miracles. I worked with A Course in Miracles. I promoted A Course in Miracles. And, you know, I honestly, you know, it was an article of faith for me that, you know, of course, Jesus um, dictated the Course in Miracles to correct the errors of traditional Christianity. And it never occurred to me that in promoting and supporting that, I was promoting and supporting a new sectarian version of Christianity to compete with the older traditional form. I can imagine Marion Williamson might be the same. I mean, she writes about um, letting go of the old stories so the universe can write a new one. And I, I don't know, but I imagine she's universal. She believes she's universal. And, and it never occurs to her that she's setting up some new sectarian and divisive approach. Um, these things are subtle. Because, you know, part of the problem here is that New Agers never really meet um, Christians. I certainly didn't. Or, you know, not much. I hardly ever met Catholics. And I think, you know, the idea that there were seriously intellectual, thinking Catholics um, out there thinking, praying Catholics would have been hard for me to believe. But, alas, the boot is on the other leg as well. There's all kinds of Catholics out there who can't believe that there are hordes and hordes and hordes of New Agers out there who seriously, take very seriously their beliefs and are now promoting them vastly across the mass media. And that is why I often refer to Catholics and New Agers like ships in the night, barely conscious of each other's existence. At least that's how it seems to me after nearly 20 years since I became a Catholic, that Catholics and New Agers seem very unaware of each other. I mean, they're frankly, they don't find each other very interesting. Um, and it seems to me that Catholics are very unaware of this massive phenomenon, even though it's becoming increasingly powerful throughout all the media. I mean, it seems to me that Catholics are so often very aware of other threats to the faith, other threats to civilization, to life. I mean, Catholics are very admirably aware of life, the life of the unborn child, and are fighting for that. And you will find that Catholics are very, very conscious, I think, of the tyranny of secularism, of globalism, of political correctness. Um, but this phenomenon, the New Age phenomenon, seems to have really gone underneath the Catholic radar screen, even though it's through and through the mass media. To take just one very, very obvious example, there are the Matrix films, with top Hollywood star Keanu Reeves in which the main character achieves power, power beyond measure, once he realizes the world is an illusion. But that's just one 
flagrant example of what I mean. I mean, that's pretty hard to miss. Um, massively promoted by Hollywood, top star, top budget, millions and millions of dollars um, being spent on this film. We could talk about something like The Da Vinci Code. Again, top Hollywood star, Tom Hanks, American Memorial Day opening. Um, you know, real money is being thrown at promoting New Age ideas in Hollywood um, in a way that traditional Catholic or Christian ideas would never be promoted. And as I say, these are just the most flagrant or blatant examples. Um, you can find, you know, far more subtle um, examples of this through and through the mass media everywhere. And arguably, it's possibly the more subtle and insidious ideas that are, are more damaging. Um, but yeah, we've spoken about these talk shows like Oprah Winfrey and Bill Maher. Um, we could also talk about Larry King and CNN um, because the earlier mentioned Neil Donald Walsh has appeared on those. Um, as also has Eckhart Toll. We talked about Eckhart Toll in episode 10, Eckhart Toll of the Power of Now. Um, um, you know, friends, if I had, you know, back in the 80s when I was so into the New Age, I would be thrilled to see the massive success of the New Age over the last 30 years. Um, this has been, it's now mainstream, and yet Catholics seem to have hardly noticed at all some of the time, it seems to me, like it's just slipped under the radar screen. Protestants often seem much more aware. Um, and, you know, as I say, I, one of the reasons for this is that Catholics don't find New Agers very interesting. Um, I get that. I mean, now that I'm a Catholic, I don't find the New Age very interesting. Um, it pales in comparison to what I've found now. Um, so it's like, yeah, I've said it before in these videos, the New Age is boring. Um, but just because it's boring doesn't mean we can ignore it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I've written my new book, the Gentle Traditionalist Returns, to try to find a way to make the New Age less boring. Um, I've written this book um, as something of an attempt at a popular, accessible um, introduction to New Age thinking. Really, it functions as something like a crash course in New Age ideology. Or I hope it functions as a crash course in New Age ideology. Now, it may seem strange to describe a novel as a crash course in ideology, but those who know my first Gentle Traditionalist book know it wasn't so much a novel, but a dialogue of ideas, where the fiction really takes second place to the ideas, and much of the new book is like that too, laid out in dialogue format, as you can see here. Anyway. The new book is a bit different. Um, it's a bit closer to being a real novel than the first one, um, because although it has the main characters in the original book, it also has um, two new New Age characters. And maybe I'll just read you a little bit from the back cover of the book. Um, Anna's cousin Bridget, who grew up Catholic, is now entangled with Gareth Lightshadow, a slick salesman of post-Christian enlightenment. Enter the gentle traditionalist who deftly exposes the contradictions, confusions, and lies within Light Shadow's shallow creed, spiritual but not religious, which brackets out sin and the cross. The result is often heartlessness including toward the unborn child, a key theme of this very pro-life book. Those lines were mainly generated by my publisher, the very fine Angelico Press, and I'm going to just read you two last lines they supply because they really, in my view, hit the nail on the head. Um, here we go. We are left with no doubts. Something profoundly disturbing an epochal shift is underway, driven by giant political and economic interests. 
It is time to wake up, time to see clearly, time to act. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to convey in the book, also making, or at least suggesting, some of the New Age links to globalism, to the giant corporations, to capitalism, modern capitalism. Um, but I'm also trying to do something else. I'm trying, with the two characters, the two New Age characters, to sort of suggest something about what this New Age mentality or this New Age mindset is like. So there's two characters. One is very gullible, naive, sweet-natured, but not really thinking things through. And that's the way many New Agers, maybe most New Agers are. Um, certainly, you know, I don't know if I was sweet-natured, but I went to Findhorn when I was 16. Findhorn, if you don't know, is really... Some people would say it's the seminal New Age centre in the world. Some people would say that, along with Esalen. Um, anyway, I was attracted to this kind of thing when I was 16. Um, young, gullible, uh, not thinking things through. And it seems to me that really a lot of New Agers are like that. They're often young, or young at heart. And there are things that are attractive on the New Age scene. I mean, Findhorn had a highly developed ecological awareness, and that's important, friends. We are poisoning the earth. We are poisoning the oceans. We are poisoning uh, the atmosphere. It's important to be aware of these things. Um, the problem is, is when ecology um, turns into a religion in and of itself, which is frequently what happens in the New Age. But there's no problem with, should needless to say, should be needless to say, in being a conscious steward of God's creation. Now, I have to say that the other New Age character in the book is not so gullible or naive. He's really quite a sinister piece of work, and I have a certain regret in creating a character like this, because most New Agers, it has to be said, are not like this character. Um, really, I wanted to take all the worst aspects of the New Age mentality, roll them up into one, and illustrate them through this character. This is what the book is really about. It's meant to be a popular, accessible introduction to a mentality of these hordes of New Agers that Catholics never meet, uh, or rarely meet. Uh, I'm trying to really get at this mentality here, and for that reason, I'd just like to go back briefly to Oprah Winfrey again and Marianne Williamson. You are the best prayer writer sayer, giver, I have ever known. Thank you. You are one praying woman. Well, how how do the maybe, prayers come to you so... You maybe are it's the, something about how bad I'm eating them. <laughs> no, you are the best prayer I have ever known. You know, friends, if I had seen that when I was young, I might have lapped it up. And maybe some young people you know, your sons, your daughters, your nephews, your nieces, are also lapping it up. But if we reflect on that from a position of being steeped in 2,000 years of Catholic tradition instead of pop culture, um, it really does begin to look rather too facile, too easy. Indeed, I have to say to me, it looks rather smug, rather self-congratulatory. And this is part of the problem with the New Age mentality. It's very referent to itself, very turned in on itself. I mean, um, you know, if I were to say to some of my old New Age friends that um, maybe there are great Catholic saints or even recent popes like Benedict XVI who might know more about prayer than Marian Williamson, I can even imagine some of them might laugh a little or smile at me rather indulgently. Um, because for them, it's obvious that Marian Williamson has transcended religion. That makes her more evolved, more conscious than stuck-in-the-mud popes like, you know, Benedict XVI. Um, um, she's the one who's tuned into the universe, the new story that the universe is allegedly trying to write. Um, and I don't know. It's like, you know, I can imagine that Oprah Winfrey isn't even, you know, when she speaks about Marion Williamson being the best prayer that she knows, 
she's not even thinking about Catholics. She's not thinking about people like um, Pope Benedict XVI or indeed St. John Paul II. You know, friends, my online dictionary defines dogma as a principle or a set of principles laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true. New Agers deny they have dogmas, but it looks to me like something very much like this is going on. We have these New Age authorities like Oprah Winfrey or Marion Williamson, Eckhart Tolle, um, people who are called spiritual teachers or spiritual experts for no other reason than that's what they call themselves. And they function as authorities. And they posit this central New Age dogma that you can transcend religion. You can do it all by yourself. You don't need the church because there's one timeless essence uh, beyond all religions. That is held to be incontrovertibly true by New Agers. I mean, you take that idea away, friends, the whole thing collapses. Collapses like a house of cards. It's a dogma. You have to believe that in order for the whole New Age thing to make sense. Or, you know, there's the idea of the mountain. We're all headed up to the top of the same mountain by different paths. You know, friends, I once took that very, very seriously. That was a New Age dogma for me. But you know what? If climbing to the top of that mountain means that I need to see all of reality as illusion, I need to see all suffering as illusion, if it means that I'm not accountable for the suffering I cause. If it means that there is no pain in the other world, you know, there's no purgatory, there's no hell, there's just... Light show. Fabulous. To quote uh, Miss Williamson again, um, if it means that I don't need um, um, two or three thousand years of Judeo-Christian tradition uh, with inspired saints and geniuses, all I need is me? Well, friends, you know what? I choose a different mountain. According to the New Age, that mountain can't even exist. But I choose the Christian and Catholic mountain. It's a mountain that's hard work to ascend, but as I try to make my ascent, I find it infinitely more rewarding than the New Age mountain. So um, that's some of what my new book is about. It's a very personal book, really. Um, but it's not just about the New Age. Uh, I think I've said already that it's a very, very, very pro-life book. It was written in the wake of the horror of Ireland's um, abortion referendum. Um, again, this is not an issue that really matters to New Ages very much, abortion. Um, but it's also about other things as well. Um, it's about um, the great Chester Belloc. Indeed, Chesterton and Belloc even feature as characters in the book. And it's also called A Catholic Knight's Tale because it's about a knight who gets to meet, uh, in a certain sense, the Emperor of Christendom. And I think I'll also tell you the book's epigram. The epigram, of course, is a little quote authors often put up front to capture the essence of their book. My epigram is this. When I am weak, then I am strong, which is St. Paul to the Corinthians. And truly, that says something very important about this book. But if you want to know more about the new book, I'll just say I did a whole video about it. And that video is episode 20. All right, friends, uh, not much more to say now. I think before I go, I want to say that I am aware that this video could seem like a hit job, a character assassination attempt, particularly on my old friend who was kind enough to come over from Britain to see me. Um, I trust it isn't. I, this is, again, a fable. Um, I've blurred that person's identity so much. That, I mean, that New Age Mac might not even be a man, might be a woman. Um, and I just kept bringing in memories of other old 
um, new age folk I've known. Um, so really what I'm trying to get at here is not individuals. Individuals who are often very idealistic, very kind, um, sincere, um, but rather a mentality that I think Catholics are too little acquainted with. Um, now I'll also point out before I go that there are other videos about the New Age on this channel. Um, I'll particularly reference episode 9 where I talk a lot more about my experience at Findhorn and I also point to something called Theosophy which is really the Eastern root of the New Age, a form of Eastern Esotericism or Eastern Occultism pioneered by Helena P. Blavatsky, that's an image of her here, who established the Theosophical Society in 1875 in New York City. I maintain that Blavatsky, along with her heir, Alice Bailey, are truly the major root of today's New Age movement, which might seem to conflict with what I say about American books like A Course in Miracles and Conversations with God. We'll go into that seeming discrepancy another time. Right now though, I just want to say that my favourite video on the New Age on this channel isn't my own. It's from my beloved wife Kim, and it's her deeply moving conversion story, and it's called From Atheism to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Uh, but Kim also talks a lot about the New Age as well. All right, friends, nearly finished. Uh, except to say that if you're interested in my new book, The Gentle Traditionalist Returns, you'll find um, an Amazon link to it down below in the text. Um, unsurprisingly, you'll also find links to my other two um, books. Indeed, you'll even find um, links to my Amazon author page, where you can see all three books simultaneously, if you like. Um, but that's all I'm going to say now, except to say that if you like what you see here, please hit the like button. Please think about subscribing. I also appreciate comments. Um, I'm slow at getting back to comments than most people. I find the internet with all this back forth, back forth, zing, 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 um, disturbs my prayer life. But so I'm cultivating slowness. Um, doesn't fit well with the modern age. But I, I do try to respond to pretty much all the comments I get, and I do appreciate them very much. And that's all I'm going to say right now, friends, except thank you, and God bless you.